guy. I think Social Security should be pr uh, privatized. You can't go to a supermarket without being accosted by a homeless guy. Democrats and liberals attack viciously. I will take over store time. Not if I have anything to say about it, Skeletor. We will fight to the death. Or, gentlemen, may I suggest a second option? What if we all enjoy the great taste of sugar crisp? Can't get enough of that sugar crisp, sugar crisp, sugar crisp. And we're back with more of the Pope on film. Bonnie! Yes? If you're like me, you're no doubt a big fan of this podcast, the Pope on film. I mean, who is it? This podcast is sweeping the nation. It's, uh, it's mopping the nation. But only the real fans, the true hardcore fans that have been with us since the beginning, uh, who, 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 you know, are in the chat rooms, who are constantly updating the Pope on Film wiki fan yeah. page, the episode you know, the hardcore guide. fans. Yeah, the ones who do the the Pope on Film fantasy leagues, which are very popular. Uh they only they know the two main facts about the both of us. The two absolutely real and in no way made up on the spot facts about the both of us. America's hottest will they or won't they couple? The next Sam and Diane. It's Bunny and May Lynn. First yes. and foremost, Bunny is the fact that when you are not recording the podcast, Bunny, you are in fact a celebrated chemist. So tell us, Bunny, what are you? And the boys down at the lab, what are you guys currently working on? Oh, my biggest project is I am trying to develop a way to make it so that Silly Putty won't stretch or pick up comics. Nice. You know, so it, it, it will uh, be less... Basically, I'm trying to develop serious putty. I okay? love that idea so much. Because there are just some things we need to be more serious about. Well, here's the thing. You get silly putty, you put it on the newspaper, and you can copy 
um, an article or copy a picture or copy uh, the latest uh -oh. uh, adventures of Dilbert. And you know what that is? That's copyright infringement. Well, not only is it copyright infringement, you can then take that image of Dilbert from that silly putty and sell it to the Chinese. In China. Yeah. China. Trump really pronounced China weird for someone who pays more taxes in that country than here. Yes. I he, find he's it... more of a Chinese citizen than an American citizen, so it's it's weird that he pronounces it so silly. Yeah. I, I but, find it funny that they're concerned about possibly banning TikTok because ch the Chinese can possibly be spying t on us through TikTok. Don't they have cable? Don't they have cable in China? I mean, I, I mean yeah. I'm pretty sure they get all the same shit we get. Like, what's to know? We're barking mad. We don't have any decent secrets anymore. It's And it's funny, too, because uh, Congress is like, oh, China might be spying on us and getting pertinent information about us through TikTok. Let me just get on Facebook and talk about this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, it's just... If they're using... TikTok to spy on us, then they're not doing a very good job of spying on us. Yeah. You know, there's so many other ways for us to spy. We're spying on ourselves. Yes. We don't need TikTok for that. Well, uh, just so, like just like the the other balloon that we shot down. Yeah. The one that was yeah. not a Chinese balloon. The one that they were trying to say was a UFO for a little while. Until mm. they had to admit it was just a balloon. It was a hot air balloon. There was a local hot air balloon, whatever, touristy. I don't know. You you pay them something. You go up in the balloon. You know what's funny? One of them have, it, have that missing. And something like 400000 per missile to take down this balloon. Yeah. Just get Bart Simpson with his freaking slingshot. There you go. Boom. A military that has close to a trillion dollar a year budget. They are not able to tell the difference between a balloon and intergalactic space vehicles. Yeah. You know what's funny is that Biden does a, a speech in November about how they shot down so many more balloons. There was one shaped like Kermit. There was one shaped like Snoopy. Yeah. There was one shaped like Charlie Brown. There was a woman sewed into the pants. Yeah. They just announced season three of I Think You Should Leave with Tim Robinson. Ah, it's coming out May 30th. I am super excited. It's like a million Super Bowls having sex with WrestleMania for me. <laughs> I'm so excited. Oh, an all new thing to obsess over. So that's the first fact about Bunny. The second fact, which is about me, is that I'm a lover of history. I love it, but I'm also a storyteller. So this is the part of the podcast where I get a story from the history books, maybe one that you don't know too well, and reword it via my own unique storytelling style. And that's what this is, another educationally uneducational installment of historic approximations, or as we like to call it, <laughs> that's capital H, G, H. Capital H, capital A, small p. The small p is vital to the ebb and flow of the entire podcast. We need it, Bunny. Bunny needs it. Bunny needs P. <laughs> 
and programming note for years, which is crazy to think about. This segment was called Steve's Historic Approximations, or SHAP, as we like to call it repeatedly, annoyingly, whether anyone wanted us to or not. However, a dead name is a dead name for a reason, and so we are moving on! So what's happening with HAP this week? This is a fascinating story, really fascinating. We're getting, we're digging deep into it. Um, it's the absolute true story of a murderer, a repeated murderer, and the surprising, the surprisingly famous historical name that got him out of jail so he could continue his dastardly crime spree. Okay. It's pretty crazy. Well, the murderer in question is named Jack Abbott. But of course, he's known as Jack Henry Abbott because once you murder someone, you have to have three names. Yes, you do. Just period. How odd it must be. How how odd. Okay. Your name is Lee. Oh, uh, everyone calls me Lee. Oh, hi Lee. How you doing? What are you up to today? Oh, nothing. Just going to pose for a picture with this newspaper and this rifle. Cool. Good to see you, Lee. Oh, hey. What are you doing today, Lee? Oh, I was thinking of going over to the parade. Wave at uh, Kennedy. Oh, cool. See you later, Lee. And, and all your life, your name's Lee. It's always just been Lee, just Lee. You kill one lousy president, however. <laughs> and boom, suddenly you're all, why is everyone using my middle name? Harvey? That's freaking weird, right? I can't imagine people calling me by my first name and middle name and last name every time that they mentioned me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you don't see me calling you H. John Bunford Big Dick Williams III every time I talk about you. Not every time. Not every time. And speaking of middle names, I presently don't have one. A lot of people at church call me May because they assume that May is my first name and Lynn is my first, is my middle name. But no, May Lynn is my first name. I want to be called May Lynn. Not May. My name isn't May. I'm not May Parker. I'm May Lynn. It, what, it, I haven't figured out a middle name yet, but what I like is right now, my middle name is unchangeable. Is interchangeable. I change it regularly. I'm, uh, it, it's unexpected. In fact, you could say, unexpected is my middle name. Uh huh. What I did there. My middle yeah. name is uh my 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 name is now May Lynn Unexpected. Yes. Sometimes I change it. It's like, hey, honey, do you want to smooch a little bit? You know, smooching is my middle name. So I can change it based on what I what I need it for. My middle name is basically a Swiss Army knife. Yes. So I like that. So, Jack Abbott, that's our HAP recipient of the week. But before we get to him, uh, let's name drop someone famous. Norman Mailer. Okay. Also known as, also known as, that one guy, what's his freaking name? Oh yeah, Norman Mailer. A legendary writer who lived from 1923 to 2007. He had 11 best-selling books, one Pulitzer Prize, six wives, nine children, and one conviction of assault for stabbing and nearly killing his wife in the 60s. This guy was crazy. This and he is wrote the those way Hobbit books. <laughs> those Hobbit books? Yeah, those are good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, I, I was trying to figure out how to explain Norman Mailer, but Norman Mailer was part of a group of people who were making fiction, nonfiction, 
where it's like, I'm going to tell the story of this murderer. But I'm going to make it a fiction story. But it's a fiction story based on this real person. And we're just going to mix a, mix a little bit of fiction and nonfiction. So basically, Norman Mailer is, if Hunter S. Thompson never did drugs and just drank a crap ton. Yeah. That's Norman Mailer. He's one of those masculine American writer types whose real life shenanigans were just as crazy as his books, you know? He was a rifleman in WW2. He was a filmmaker. He was a journalist, a playwright. He founded the Village Voice. I believe he has the last lines in the movie Son of Sum Summer of Sam, if I'm not mistaken. Does he? Possibly. Yeah, I think he's also interviewed for in a what's the name of that great documentary about the rumble in the jungle when we were kings? Oh, I haven't seen that in so long. That that is such a good documentary. Um, his book, Norman Mailer's book, The Executioner's Song, won the Pulitzer Prize in 1980, and also. His 2007 novel, The Castle in the Forest, won Literary Review Magazine's Bad Sex in Fiction Award. And I think that everyone will agree that Literary Review Magazine's Bad Sex in Fiction Award is a more prestigious award than the friggin' Pulitzer, right? Oh, yeah. Most certainly. I mean, which one would you rather win? The Pulitzer or the Bad Sex and Fiction Award? I hands down. Yeah, well, I well, would rather win the Bad Sex and Fiction Award. The, the Pulitzer is nice, but but for the Bad Sex and Fiction Award, uh, the award itself is is really cool because it's just two Smurfs fucking. Nice, two Smurfs fucking band name called it. Uh, <laughs> So Norman Mailer, hard living, heart stabbing. Don't marry. He had six wives, nine children. And one of those six wives, he stabbed in the stomach. Don't date Norman Mailer. He's yeah, a no. stabber. He's a stabber. There's a, if you marry Norman Mailer, there's a one in six chance you'll be stabbed. That's fascinating. So He's a stabber. Successful writer, every other area of his life, total fucking failure. Successful writer, not so successful stabber, because he only di he did stab one of the six. Yeah. So, I'm assuming he was too drunk to and just missed the stomach of the other five. Yeah. So hard living, he, hard stabbing. He, he was. He was totally Ward Cleaver with the other five. <laughs> yeah. Oh, honey. Dinner was amazing. Might stab you tomorrow. Oh. All yeah. right. Going to bed. Good night. But, you oh. know. Ah, thought I'd try and stab you, but, but oh, you're But quick. forget his pipe once. Yeah. Once. Yep. That's, how, that's how my dad was. It's surprising that Norman Mailer was able to become so famously successful given that he was a convicted wife stabber. Uh, but I guess back then cancel culture wasn't what it is now. Yeah. Anywho, that's a uh, norm normie mailman. A uh, quick programming note. <laughs> This will not be the last time that we talk about Mr. Normal Mailman. Because okay. he had a habit of writing plays and then saying, oh, this play would be a good movie. So he would get he would make a play and then he'd turn it into a movie. And uh, in 1984, he released a novel, Tough Guys Don't Dance, which was based on a play. It, 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 no, no. He released a book called Tough Guys Don't Dance. It came out in 1984. He rush wrote it in two months due to contractual obligations. That's a sign of a good novel. Yes, it is. 
And uh, three years later, he wrote and directed a movie version, which is now considered by many, including moi, to be one of the funniest bad melodramas ever made. 1987's Tough Guys Don't Dance. Uh, it gave us the amazing scene of Ryan O'Neill. He reads the, he reads a letter and, and the camera just circles around him as he goes, Oh, God! Oh, man! Oh, God! Oh, man! Oh, God! Literally for like a minute. It's such a bad movie. I friggin' love it. And... I want to do the movie sometime this year. So, uh, so eventually. You ever seen yeah. that movie, Bunny? No. It is horrible, and I love it. I so, love it. So, Pulitzer Prize winner, Norman Mailer. Normal Mailman, yes. Right. Does Tough also Guys... Also wrote and directed one of the worst movies of all time. Tough Guys Don't Dance... How many years after Real Men Don't Eat Quiche? I have no idea. It's so bad, it's great. It is such a bad movie. It's great. I Tough Guys Don't Dance. It's stupid, and I love it. Anywho, let's put a pin on Normal Mailman. The Pope on Film, single-handedly propping up the pin industry since 2014. Yes. It's almost a decade of this podcast. Wow. Because let's go back to the murderer. Mr. Three Names, Jack Henry Abbott. Jackie boy. He was born in Michigan in the 1940s to an Irish soldier and a Chinese prostitute. He was a Chirish. Uh, he was ditched by his parents and put into foster care. And starting at age nine, he was in and out of juvenile detention facilities. So when he came of age, yeah, he's in and out of jail. So Jackie boy, he's 21 years old, okay? And he's in jail in Utah, of all places. Yeah. He's in there for forgery, so I don't know. He's he's forging Mormons. Oh, well, my he, goodness. He, he, he was in jail because he only had one wife. Yeah. Forging Mormons, that was my favorite CW drama. Yeah. Forging Mormons. Um, he gets into a fight with another inmate, and boom, Jackie Boy ends up stabbing the inmate to death. He's given 23 years, but then, in 1971, he escapes and robs a bank in Colorado... Your neck of the woods, Bunny. He's re-caught. So now he's serving his time for the forgery. Then he got 23 years for the stabbing he did in jail in Utah. And now they've given him 19 years more for the escape and the robbery. So he's doing 42 plus years, which is some hard time. So they end up putting a... And then he's just angry and violent and he's not remorseful and he's just like ah I'm a stabber and so they end up putting Jackie Boy Stabbington in solitary for most of his time in there which is harsh so in 1977 this is the part where our two stories what? collide in, in oh okay in 1977, Normal Mailman is writing his novel, The Executioner's Song, which he would ev eventually win his Pulitzer Prize for. That book is a fictional account of the real life of criminal and murderer Gary Mark Gilmore. His story is interesting. Uh, the, the nation gave up uh, the death penalty for a while pre-Reagan. Reaganomics, you know, the state just gave up killing people, and um, Gary Mar Gilmore is like, Yep, I murdered him. I don't feel bad about it. I'll do it again. I demand y'all kill me. And the state's like, Oh, I'm going to be honest with you. Usually we do this against people's will. We're not used to people who want us to do it. This seems pretty sus. I don't know if we're going to kill you. Damn it. I need you to kill me. I'm going to kill again. Kill that guy. Kill her. I need y'all to kill me. 
So uh, nor normal mailman wrote a book about it, and he got a bunch of awards. Um, so our criminal friend, Jack Henry, three names, he gets an idea. Hmm. So he starts writing normal mailman from prison. Okay. And he's all, hey, uh, Norman Mailer. I forgot his name because normal mailman is so fun. Hey, Norman Mailer, this, this guy from this book, Gary Mark Gilmore, he's lying to you. He's embellishing the facts. He's, he's, he's making his story sound more grandiose. Um, he's embellishing the true story of what it's like in prison. I'm in prison. I'm spending time in solitary. I stabbed someone in here. I escaped. And then I robbed a bank. Uh, I'll tell you what it's really like. And so normal mailman is all drooling because, ooh, look at all of these. I don't know. Maybe he's got a, a crime, a true crime fetish. So Norm, Norman Mailer writes him back. Dear Mr. Abbott, I don't think he has a, he doesn't have a, a southern accent, but for this story, I'm giving him a southern yeah. accent. Dear Mr. Abbott, before you had my curiosity, but now you have my attention. And so they become pen pals for years. And, uh, uh, what's his name? Jackie, Jackie Three Names just keep sending him these massive letters of exactly what it's like in prison, and here's the details, and all of this, and here you go, and yada, 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 for years. And eventually, Mailer is just drooling all over uh, Abbott's story. Uh, he's moved, I tell you, moved. In fact, he's so moved that Mailer makes a compilation of all of Abbott's letters to him, and gets a publisher interested in it, and the publisher works on making it into a novel called In the Belly of the Beast, a non-fictional first-hand account of Jackie's life in and out of jail uh, and a peek inside of the American prison system. And as it's getting ready to be released in the early 80s, normal mailman is on the news. Yes, hello, it is I, now he's British, it is I, the... Pulitzer Prize winning author, Mr. Norman Mailer. And I am here today for one reason. To campaign for Jack Henry Abbott to be released from prison. This man is merely a tragic victim of the American prison system. The American prison system, once it's got its hold on you, it wants to keep you in there so that you never get out. It is a travesty that this man from, a from his childhood was forced into this life. It is, it, it is our fault, society's fault, that he is in jail and other important sounding intellectual things. Uh, he is a tragic victim of the American prison system, as outlined in his up soon to be published upcoming book in the belly of the beast. Free orders now. And because Norman Mailer is an award-winning author, in 1981, Jackie Three Names has a parole hearing. And the parole officials are, um... Look, we just want to go on record as saying this is an effing stupid idea. Letting him free is dumb. Okay. This guy has zero remorse for what he's done. He is dangerous AF. He has killed before. He will kill again. This is stupid. However, due to the mounting pressure, the mounting public pressure, and Mr. Mailer's lengthy testimony, and again, this is stupid. Oh, no. Cool. Uh, Mr. Abbott, you're free to go. But I'd like to take this time to say, we told you so. And just like that, 
Jackie Three Names is a free man, thanks to his writing buddy, Mr. Normal Mailman. Norman Mailer uh, uh, is like, yay, we got him free, everyone. And he, uh, uh, Jack Henry Abbott moves into a halfway house in New York City, and he gets ready for his prison memoir to be released. Dude's the talk of the town. He's hanging out with intellectual types, hobnobbing with celebs, and other hoity-toity literary types. Oh, you just got out of prison. How droll. I read a, uh, an advanced reading copy of your novel. Uh, quite amazing. What do you intend to do afterwards? Well, wasn't, and, that, and wasn't that Eddie Murphy bit Kill My Landlord? Yeah. Basically roughly the same story. Yeah. Yeah. And it was round about that time, too. Yeah. Because uh, he got out in 1981. But here's the amazing part. Here's the amazing part. So, uh, Jack Henry Abbott, thanks to Norman Mailer, Jack Henry Abbott gets out of jail, and he's he's the talk of the town as they get ready to publish his memoir. Jack Henry Abbott is free! Uh, for about six weeks. And then, he, it, well, it, okay, let me put it to you this way. Um, the day before his book gets published, the day before his book gets published, um, Jack Henry Abbott is at, is, uh, at a restaurant and he gets into a fight with a waiter in a, a restaurant in the East Village and it's like my grandpa used to always say. My grandpa used to always say Huh? Because he was old as hell. Yeah. My grandfather. He was 98 when he died. Dude was old. But also, my grandfather used to say you can take the stabber out of the prison, but you can't take the stabbing out of the stabber. Yeah. And yeah, Jack Henry Abbott killed someone again. Ten minute warning. Gee, gee, thanks, Norman Mailer. I am now proud to say that Norman Mailer is the winner of the Pulitzer Prize for fiction for his novel, The Executioner's Song. And he is the Literary Review's prestigious Bad Sex in Fiction Award winner. And now, Norman Mailer is the posthumous winner of the Pope on Film's first ever Poffy Award for Outstanding Achievements in the Field of Being an Accessory to Murder. Congratulations, Norman Mailer! Yes. For winning the first ever Poffy Award for Outstanding Achievements in the field of being an accessory to murder. So Jackie's book becomes a mad success. But he can't celebrate that because he's back in prison. And this time for life, no chance of parole. Fun fact, in Psycho 2, Meg Tilly can be seen reading in the belly of the beast. Oh. And then you know that she got killed and something happens to her because, wait, Meg Tilly was reading in the belly of the beast. But now she's gone. But here is her copy of In the Belly of the Beast. So what happened to Meg Tilly? So yeah, she's reading In the Belly of the Beast through the whole movie. Also, Law and Order Season 13, Episode 7. It's entitled Genius. It's way loosely based on Jackie Stabbington, three names. He did tr try and write a follow-up novel in prison, but no one cared. And eventually, in the early 2000s, a much older Jackie Three Names would hang himself in a prison cell. A sad life for a crazy stabbing man. And question, Bunny. Yes. Is Norman Mailer an accessory to murder? Because I think so. Well, see, I, I, I remember this story, except that I always thought it was Norman Fell. So, nice. Yeah. Uh, so... Uh, I don't know if he's an accessory to murder, but he is kind of sort of responsible. Yeah. He did Norman get the Mayer guy is, out. 
kind of has blood on his hands. He, and he not from the wifey clown. stab. Yeah. Man, stabbers got to protect stabbers, I guess. Maybe that's why Norman Mailer campaigned to get him out. Like, hey, us, us stabbers got to stick together. Hey, you stabs. I stabbed someone, too. Hey. Yeah. Stabbing buddies. High five. So that's it for uh, historic approximation. That's it for half this week. Norman Mailer, famous writer, stabbed his wife, got a got a murderer out of prison so he could murder again. Yeah. And yet he was still allowed to be like a successful, heroic uh, genius writer. It's like he, you, they still gave you the Pulitzer Prize after you stabbed your wife. And then what did you follow up the Pulitzer Prize award with? Getting a stabber out of jail so he can stab again. Yep. Did you say mom smells like coffee? Is that yeah. what you said? Oh, okay. You know why she smells like coffee? They drink a lot of coffee. Yeah, that's it. I am drinking Cherry Coke, the official sponsor of this episode of the Pope on Film. Oh, hold on, hold on. I need to read the copy that the Coke people gave us. Hold on. Cherry Coke. Now with 50% less rat feces. Try a cherry Coke today. That's what they told me to say. It's it's weird. It's all of this stuff that they okay. that they said. It, it's, it's just a shame that it turned out that the rat feces was a major part of the flavor. Yeah. It... Now we, have really to have, now we have to I'm have really, artificial rat feces flavoring. Let me tell you something. Um, this podcast has been known for a long time as a uh, left-leaning liberal trash. But I got to hand it to the Republicans. I am super excited that Republicans are working on reversing child labor laws because my six-year-old, there is no reason why she can't work in a mine. Yeah. No reason why she can't work deep in a coal mine. That's what my grandfather, my great grandfather, my great 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 grandfather worked in a coal mine. And why can't my six year old? You know? Yeah. So happy about that. We're going to get some more, uh, going to get some more uh, income coming into the family now that all of my kids can. Thank goodness the Republicans are focusing on what's important. The family. Like letting my six-year-old work in a coal mine. Yeah. It's about time. Uh, thank goodness. Well, for let's 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 also not forget, you know, child marriage. You know, again, that child is marriage. a good, strong family value that <gasps> they are currently championing. You you can still mm-hmm. go ahead and marry a child at any age. Yeah. Uh, so that's it for so uh, so historic- I, and and they they are trying to get it rolled back that spousal rape they're trying to make it so spousal rape is no longer a crime yeah so they have managed to they're trying to work a loophole to the whole raping children thing. It's you can remarkable. rape them, you just have to marry them first. Yeah. Hey, can somebody close the front door? Shut the front door. So that's it for historic approximations this week. Be sure and join us next week. We record every other week, but still, I I don't want I don't want to change it. I don't want to change it. Uh, join us next week. Next week, for more educationally uneducational fun with historic approximations, or as we like to call it, how? Thank you. Boom. How? We we could just start calling it a fortnight. Fortnight, like the game. No, for next two weeks. Oh, okay. Two two weeks. Gotcha. Okay. I thought you were talking about the game. We could just start calling it Minecraft. <laughs> we could just start calling it Pac-Man. Um, so, cut on that. Bunny!
Yes. It's intermission time again. We are going to be taking a short break uh, where we will be playing some videos, some music, a whole bunch of fun. And when we come back, it's finally time to talk about our movie this week, the uh, 2023. It only came out about two months ago. Uh, the 2023 uh, Brandon Cronenberg. Oh, yeah, let's go, Brandon. Uh, <laughs> the Brandon Cronenberg film Infinity Pool. And I'm just going to get to the last thing that I wrote in my notes. Um, all the critics are like, wow, what an incredible film. What, how original and new, unique. Man, Brandon Cronenberg has made sure that his films look nothing like his father's films. What freaking movie were you watching? Uh, good Christ, really? Because this just seems like um, diet crimes of the future. Yes. But, hey, but okay. We'll get to that. <laughs> um, uh, we will be right back with more of the Popon film. After this, do 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 do